Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started. I would just like to start off by welcoming everyone and I'm going to introduce myself. Um, my name is Dana Sievers and I am the chairwoman for the Seward County Republican Party. And the Seward County Republican Party is who's hosting this event tonight. Um, so I wanted to make a couple of announcements and uh, go through a couple housekeeping items first. So, first of all, am I too loud, too quiet, or just about right? Perfect. Okay, great. We are videotaping tonight, and so our presenter is going to use the microphone, our panelists are going to use the microphone, and then anybody who wants to ask a question, we have a third microphone over off to the side, and I just ask that you please plan to use that and just get up. Don't worry about getting in line, whatever, just hop over so we can make sure we can hear the questions and the answers um, on the recording. Okay, we have some snacks in the back. Most of you saw that on the way in and some water. So feel free to get up, go back and forth uh, so you can refill your snacks if you wish. The bathrooms are just through this door off to your right and across the hall. Men's and women's bathrooms are both right over there. So feel free and get up whenever you need to. I would like to offer a disclaimer at this time that um, the Seward County Republican Party uh, normally meets and gathers at the Civic Center, but this, our Civic Center is under construction right now, and so we're not gonna be able to get in there for a few months, and so we are using this space here. Um, we do pay for this space, so if anybody would like to make a donation for our facility use fee, there's a basket in the back. We appreciate that. It goes Anything that goes in that basket will go straight to the church. Um, to offset our facility rental fee. Um, the topic for tonight and the opinions of the people you're gonna hear tonight uh, are not and should not reflect back onto the church, the Rock. Um, the Rock Lutheran Church is not affiliated with the Republican Party in any way. They're not affiliated with Epic. They're not in, at all uh, connected. So I just wanna make that disclaimer that the opinions you'll hear tonight are the people who you'll be hearing from. I'm gonna make a couple introductions. Uh, the way this is gonna to work tonight is we're gonna introduce a few people, then we're gonna see a, first we're gonna, uh, after we do introductions, we're gonna hear a little bit of history on the Epic Tax Bill, and then we are going to see a presentation, and then after that, after the presentation, we're gonna have our town hall, where you will get to ask questions of the panelists. The panelists tonight are going to include the sponsor of the, the original bill and the original sponsor of the bill, uh, Senator Steve Erdman, who is right over here, quick wave. Uh, Senator Erdman is our Legislative District 47 Senator and he is the sponsor of the bill. Uh, the next panelist is going to be, and our presenter of the uh, presentation that you'll see, is Angie Eversbacher, right over here. And she is a volunteer, uh, and then she's also a local Seward landowner um, who has a vested interest, obviously, in this topic. Um, but she is not a paid lobbyist and is not being paid to present. She did this presentation all on her own and is just assisting with as a volunteer to spread the word about uh, the Epic Tax Option. The next person who is going to be on the panel tonight is Rob Rohrbaugh. Can you wave here? All right. And I wanna, I'm gonna briefly read Rob's, uh, in, some information about Rob. Um, Rob's been involved in the con consumption taxation advocacy since 2011 and represents Nebraska as a delegate to the Americans for Fair Taxation. He's a member of its marketing committee and currently president of the Consum Consumption Tax Institute. Uh, that's the research and education arm of Epic Tax Reform. Epic Option is the promotional arm, which is this presentation here. This is the promotional arm of the petition drive. Rob is a graduate of Iowa State University with a major in mathematics, minors in computer science and statistics. He also holds a master's in business administration from the University of Nebraska at Omaha with a major in decision sciences. <laughs> and so he's been at this for lo probably longer than anyone and I'm glad to have him here on the panel tonight in case there's any questions that you have that he uh, may be able to answer. He can probably answer most of them. <laughs> Um, we also are blessed tonight to have with us Senator Holleran, who is uh, LD33. He's also a co-sponsor of the bill. Here he is. And uh, some of the other co-sponsors of the bill are Senator Brewer from LD43, Senator Clemens from LD2, Senator McDonald from LD5, and Senator Merman from LD38. So we're really glad to have two senators here that are sponsor, co-sponsor, and then someone who's been doing the research and the promotion of the Epic Tax for probably longer than anyone. 
All right, so then um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna invite, I think Senator Erdman is gonna come up. What I thought we would do to start out before <coughs> Angie begins is to get an update on where the bill is. There seems to be con some confusion about what this is all about. So I'm gonna ask Senator Erdman to give us a quick update on what's the current status of the bill and what's going and then what's going on with the initiative. Senator Erdman? Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Dan. I appreciate being here. <clears throat> Let me start with this. I asked Angie what we should do when we start out, and she asked me to do a brief overview of how we got here. So let me, let me just review for you what happened. In 2017, at the end of that first session, we did absolutely nothing to improve your property tax position in the state of Nebraska. And May 23rd of 2017, I invited anybody who had any idea to try to help us reduce property tax to join me. And to my surprise, we had about 30 people show up. And we started a petition drive, and you may have heard of that one. It was to reduce your property tax by 30%. That really was not the solution. It was to force the conversation about what the solution is. And that petition went for about six or seven months and the group that was running that petition then decided, for whatever reason I don't know, to withdraw the petition. We then decided that we should try another one and so that one was a 35% reduction in your property tax and it was gonna be a property tax credit very similar to what we've tried to do in the legislature in the last couple of years. That petition drive was halted by COVID. We had volunteers going door to door and when COVID broke, it just wasn't accessible for them to go. So that petition stopped there. Then what happened is a guy by the name of Rob Rohrbaugh showed up in my office and he explained the consumption tax. And I said, before you start, let me invite a couple of friends. And so I invited Senator Holleran, Steve Holleran, and I also invited Mike McDonald. Mike McDonald is a retired fireman. He's a legislator from District 5. Mike McDonald is a Democrat. Mike McDonald is an honest, straightforward, straight shooting guy. I've never had him back up on me on anything. He's always given me his word. He's always stuck to it. He and I have worked on a lot of things together. So the three of us listened to Rob Rohrbaugh's presentation and we said, this is the answer. This really is the answer to fix our broken tax system. So as we proceeded on for the next couple of months trying to figure out what validity do we have, we have two farmers and a fireman what we know about economics. And we heard about a guy named Stephen Moore. Anybody ever hear of Stephen Moore? Everybody watch Fox Business News? Stephen Moore is on there almost every day talking about economic things. Stephen Moore came to town. We met with Stephen Moore and Governor Ricketts, the three of us did. And Stephen Moore on several occasions shared with the governor that this was a solution to fix the state property tax problem and it would also put us in a place to be envious of all of the states because we wouldn't have any property tax. So he also knows a gentleman by the name of Art Laffer. Have you ever heard of Art Laffer, the Laffer Curve? So that evening, when we were having dinner with Governor Ricketts, he got Art Laffer on the phone, and we explained to Art Laffer what we were trying to do. Art Laffer came to, our, to my office about a month later. We showed the program to Art Laffer, now remember, Art Laffer was the instigator or the author of Prop 13 in California when they fixed their property tax. Art Laffer was the advisor to Ronald Reagan when he made those income tax cuts when he was president. He was also an advisor to Donald Trump. Art Laffer reviewed what we we're trying to do and he said, if you do this, you'll become the most popular state to live, start a business, and for people that raise their families because your tax system will be better than any other in the state. And Senator Holleran told him, he said, we'll become such a popular place to live and start a business, we'll have to build a wall around the state to keep people out. <laughs> and he also said, Colorado will pay for it. <laughs> and so that's how we got here. I introduced the legislation two years ago. We've been working on it ever since. We've been promoting it to people like yourselves who are now in second place because the government goes shopping, they buy whatever they want and they send you the bill. Under the consumption tax, <coughs> you go shopping and buy something that you personally consume or hire a service that you use personally and then you send the money to the state and the state lives on that. And so that is the beginning and that's how we got where we are today. The bill will never get out of the legislature because Senator Holler brought along our tax code, and he's going to talk about that later, because our current tax code picks winners and losers. 
and they don't want to give up that authority. So we're doing a petition drive to get it on the ballot in 24 to allow you to vote to lower the taxes and do the, to the level where you're comfortable paying it. So that's a brief overview of how we got here. We have about 170 volunteers helping us. Angie is one of those. Angie is an amazing lady, understands how to put this together. This presentation will be very thorough and very interesting. So listen to what she has to say, and we're here to try to answer any other questions that you may have. But that's the beginning of where we, that's how we started, and that's how we got where we are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ehrman. Hi, I'm Angie Eberspacher and I am going to just jump right into this presentation and I ask that you hold your questions to the end and um, we'll try to get to all of those. So this is the epic option. We all know that we live in Nebraska the good life, but when you enter our state and you see the sign, if you live here, you might think it's Nebraska the tax life, home of the worst taxes in the USA. We have state income taxes, there's nine states in our United States that don't have income taxes right now. There's a great place right in the center there that we could join them. In 1967 is when we started having income taxes. Before then, we didn't even have income tax. And currently our income tax is 6.64%. The state corporate taxes are 7.25%. We have vehicle taxes. Did you realize that your car, until it's 14 years old, until it has its 14th birthday, it's paying, you're paying taxes on it? It's like a 14-year plan, rental plan for your car. And every time you sell that car, you're paying sales tax again. And every time you buy a new used car, you're paying sales tax again. How many ta sales taxes do you need to have on one car? State inheritance taxes. This is gonna to happen to all of us. Mom and dad are gonna die. Maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your grandparents. What happens when you are the one that is inheriting their land and their business? Not good in Nebraska. Right now it's 15%. We're even trying to get rid of that in the legislature right now. And there's still opposition to this. We're one of five or six states that still has the inheritance death tax. We have property taxes, fourth worst, in the property tax, they were the high, fourth highest in the United States. And it doesn't matter what kind of property you have, residential, commercial, farmland, or if you're renting your home or your apartment, you're all paying property taxes. Everyone is, nobody escapes <coughs> property taxes. The reality of this is you don't own anything. You're just renting from the government. So if you don't pay your property taxes, do you know what happens if you don't pay them for three years in a row? There's a property tax sale. This is from the Lincoln Journal Star in 2022, February 2022. There were over 1,000 properties in Lancaster County alone that were on the property tax or property sales tax sales. Who scoops those properties up? These are great opportunities for BlackRock, Bill Gates, China, all the people that we say, we don't, we can't let them come in and take over our country. We can't, we're not, we're giving them every opportunity. When we're having such high property taxes that we can't afford to pay them, that we have no other choice but to sell, either sell or give up our property, they have deep pockets. They're gonna fly right <coughs> and, and scoop them up. You have no control over your property taxes. In 2023, many Lincoln homeowners saw their property taxes increased between 10 and 30%. That's without any improvements on their homes. Just make a magic decision. Because the government decides what you pay and when you pay it. Property taxes, when do we pay them? May 1st, September 1st. Whether you can afford to at that time of year or not, they are due. And side note, you can't show up in, in, on May 1st or September 1st with your check. It's late that day. <laughs> I know, I've done it. So you know what they do if they're late? They charge you more. Nebraska farmland taxes rose 25% per year from 2012 to 2016, just because. You know what was happening during that time? 
prices of corn, everything were going up. It was great. So they're like, well, we got to tax more. But what happened when the, when the price of corn went down? Did our taxes go down? No. In fact, they keep going up. That's unfair. Nebraska is taxing you on unrealized gains on your property. Just like Janet Yellen wants to do with your stocks. That's immoral. Homes to rent. Renters say, well, I don't have to pay property taxes. I just rent. I rent an apartment or I rent my house. I don't have property taxes. Wrong. Do you think that the landlords are paying that, those increases out of the goodness of their heart? They're passing that along to you. That's why the tax, that's why your rent goes up. On average, 20% of your rent goes to property taxes. Same with the income tax, state income tax. You, you have to pay an income tax. Maybe you, you get some back, maybe you don't. But you have to pay it and hope that maybe sometime you're going to get a refund so you get it all back. They're using your money. You can't. Back in 2021, Nebraska is one of the least tax-friendly states, according to Kiplinger. This is a great analogy of, of us as taxpayers. We've been in the pot for a long time, and the heat just keeps cranking up more and more and more, and now we're in boiling water. So we need to make a decision. What are we going to do? And if you're not a frog, you're a sheep. Your wool is getting fleeced from you. This is a revered symbol in the state of Nebraska. Some may look at it as the sower, but some of us may look at it, is that a tax collector? <laughs> so we have state income tax, corporate tax, property tax, inheritance tax. There's only one thing to do. Nebraska needs the EPIC option. What is EPIC? It eliminates property, income, and inheritance corporate taxes. The Nebraska sales tax would be replaced by the consumption tax. So what is the consumption tax? This is a little quick run through and then we'll be reviewing more as we go along. There's two categories, things that will be taxed and things that will be not be taxed. New goods would have a consumption tax. Used goods, no consumption tax. All personal services, no exemptions, would eliminate all exemptions, would be taxed. Business to business inputs would not have a consumption tax. Restaurant food would have a tax because it's a service that's being prepared for you and served to you. But groceries that you buy, or if you're on SNAP, government assistance for food, not be taxed. Nonprofits buying new would have to pay the consumption tax on their new items that they purchase. And nonprofits buying used, same as us, would not have to pay a consumption tax. Same for the government, new buying new items would have a consumption tax, government buying used would not. It really puts all of us on the same playing field. We'd have the same excise taxes that we already do on items such as fuel, alcohol, alcohol, and tobacco, and there would be no, no taxes, um, no consumption taxes on investments or education as an investment or health care with insurance. You know, we'll go through some typical examples. You buy an existing home that's been on the market, it's already been lived in by somebody, it's been bought once, no consumption tax. You buying a new home, you'll have to pay the 7.5 consumption tax. And I know there's a lot of pushback from a lot of the home builders right now, but we have some really smart people in this room who can answer these questions for you. And I look forward to that discussion coming up. Used cars, not taxed. Like I said, someone's already paid the sales tax on that. Why do we have to keep paying it? Actually, it's very smart. New cars, vehicles would have a consumption tax. Now I've heard, well, no one's ever going to buy anything new now. And I have to say, I, in my opinion, I don't believe that to be true because the people that I know who buy new vehicles will still want to buy new vehicles. It's just what they do. Groceries, not taxed. Snap, not taxed. Like I said, going to a restaurant where you would have a consumption tax. 
If you're going to the thrift store and you're buying used items, no tax. New items, yes. Same for furniture and new furniture would have a consumption tax. Those are some quick examples. All personal services would be taxed. I don't know if you know, but there are so many exemptions and loopholes that do not currently pay into our tax system. There's no sales tax on a lot of items. For example, dog grooming, your hair, getting your nails done. There is no sales tax. And so it's like, well, that's not going to be fair. Then I'm going to have to pay more taxes. But really, let's think about it. If you have um, a haircut or you're getting your nails done, it costs you $30, which I know haircuts cost sometimes more than that, but I'm talking to the guys. Uh, $30, what's 7.5% on $30, $2.25. And if you do that every month for a whole year, it's going to be not that big of a, of a payment considering what you're saving in your income tax and your property tax. It's all in perspective. So like we said, the excise taxes would continue on such things as alcohol, tobacco products, fuel. The Epic Option, what it does, it distinguishes between the consumers and the producers. Consumers pay taxes on their new personal consumption. Producers don't pay taxes on their inputs to produce. So we'll go through these really quickly. Farming. Agriculture is our number one industry in the state of Nebraska. Business to business inputs. Farming is a business. You buy something for your tractor or for your farm business. You're buying it from a company. That's a business to business input. There'd be no consumption tax on that. Same with your, your businesses in town. They're buying something for their business. No consumption tax. Same, in, same thing goes for businesses in Lincoln, in Omaha, no matter how small or large you, the place you live, you have a business and you're buying something for your business, no consumption tax. Education, we would not be taxing tuition. To, uh, education is an investment just like at the universities. Healthcare. Healthcare is considered business to business when your healthcare is also, when your insurance company is cooperating and working on paying your bill with your doctor or your hospital. Those are business to business expenses. However, when you are having your copay out of your pocket expenses or to meet your deductibles at first, those would have a 7.5% consumption tax. Schools, universities, government, nonprofits, churches. Epic Option considers these entities consumers. New items are taxed. Used items are not taxed. So quickly to go through this, if you're buying paper for your printer or any office machinery for your church or your nonprofit, your schools, your universities, you would have consumption tax on those purchases if they are new. Software, computers, vehicles, if you're buying used, there would be no consumption tax on those items. I theoretically, you will have more money to give to nonprofits, charities, and churches. What you're saving in thousands of dollars on paying property taxes and your income tax, state income tax, you you get to decide what to do with that money. Do you want to donate some to the to Concordia? Do you want to donate some to the university? Do you want to donate more to your church? you'll have more freedom to do what you want with your money. So here's the simple version. Stuff you own, including your income, not taxed. Stuff you buy new for yourself would have a consumption tax. Stuff you buy for your business, not taxed. And groceries that you buy, not taxed. So items are taxed only once, one time. There's no double taxation. We have to ask ourselves, why do we keep paying taxes on the same property, on the same items, over and over and over? When is it ever going to be enough? So instead of paying 20% of your rent going toward property taxes, 0% of your rent would go to property taxes. And if you have an awesome landlord who understands this, if I, I talked to a guy on Sunday, 
He owns several properties and leases them out. And he said he, his calculations that within two years, he'd be able to pay off all of his money that he's had to like pay in taxes all these years. He'd be able to reduce his um, leases for his tenants. There also be no withholding of your money from Nebraska state taxes because your income is your money. You decide what you pay and when you pay it. Consumption tax would be done on new things that you do for yourself. Maybe you're buying that in February. Maybe you say, hey, I have, we've saved up. It's now June. I think we can buy something instead of having to do it mandatorily on May 1st and September 1st. But where will the money come from? Like I said, we're gonna eliminate all of the exemptions and loopholes that are currently in our statutes. Our current tax base is 60 billion. By eliminating the tax um, exemptions, we're gonna multiply our tax base 2.7 times to increase it to 162 billion. So if you can imagine, here's a, this is a great graphic. You have 60 billion tax base across the state of Nebraska. That's currently what's paying sales tax right now. We get rid of sales tax and create the consumption tax, and we expand the tax base by eliminating them to $162 billion. It grows our tax base. We need $11.6 billion of revenue to cover all the schools and government as they are currently being funded. How much will your taxes go down? This is a farmer in this county Farm family that's been here for their children of the fourth generation to live on the farm. So they're looking at wanting to pass this, this farm on to the next generation. This is what they're paying in income tax, property tax, personal property tax, vehicles, and sales tax under the current system. With that thing, the way to calculate what you would pay in consumption tax, you take your, what your, your sales tax is and multiply it at about 2.7%. That's what you'll be paying in consumption tax throughout the year. Look at the difference. Again, taking it from 60 billion to 162 billion by eliminating all the exemptions and loopholes. So how will the tax dollars be distributed? There's a plan currently that's called the Budget and School Equalization and Review Board Regions that divides the state into five equal sections, about 18 or 19 counties each. And these board regions will be represented by local people. And their purpose is not to look at each one and say, no, you can't have that bus, or no, you can't have this, and you can't do that. It's just to look at the budget that's being done by every school and, and county, school, city, um, group and they just need to this group is going to say yes you're following the state statutes and we send it on or no you, you you've exceeded what you can do you need to go back and review this because state law says you can only do this much obviously there's a lot of opposition going on a lot of talking points and propaganda being spread by the Nebraska Chamber the Open Sky Institute ITAP and they're influencing also from a lot of lobbyists that are on behalf of the education industry, the realtors, auto dealership, home builders, they all have lobbyists and they all are working really hard to keep all of the laws in place. But why? Let's see what they're saying. Open Sky and ITEP. Tax rate will have to be higher, will have to be 15% or higher. There's no way it can be 7.5%. Well, Fear is a great thing. Fear is a great motivator. So of course no one wants to believe that 7.5, that sounds almost too good to be true. The Beacon Hill Institute has done a, a dynamic in-depth study and has found that this actually will work. The other part of this is that the Open Sky and ITEP study failed to take into account that 61 billion in taxable sales due to elimination of loopholes. They're still basing all their information without taking into consideration that we would eliminate all of the exemptions. But you'll lose local control and all the money will still go to Lincoln. Well, the money already goes to Lincoln. And what Epic does is change the source of money from property taxes to consumption taxes. And here's what the next, pe the next thing people will say. This is not a tax, um, this isn't solving our tax issue. We, first we have to cut spending. We have to get spending under control before we can do anything with this, this is just a tax shift. 
All right, let's call it a tax shift. How do you ever expect to cut spending? How many years have we been having ta property taxes continually rise? Everyone's had every opportunity every year to cut spending. Does it happen? It's not gonna happen organically. It's like when your child says, I want money, I wanna go buy this. Do you say, well, here's, here's a check, go just go buy whatever you want, or do you give them an allowance? Their choice then is to save their money to, so that they have what they need when they want it, or they're gonna budget and use only what they have in their hand as their allowance. It's like the chicken and the egg. We can't cut spending without cutting their funding. We can't cut funding without cutting their spending. Like who's gonna move first? So we've given them several years to figure out how to cut spending and they're not doing it. So we're gonna give them some parameters. Jobs will leave Nebraska. That makes no sense because why would jobs leave Nebraska? They wanna to come to Nebraska. Right now, corporations don't wanna come here. Our taxes are terrible. If we eliminate the state corporate tax, the state income tax, their employees will want to live here because they get to keep more of their money in their pocket. We don't have property taxes, that's great for the businesses, and it's also great for the employees who want to come here, buy their homes, buy their land, and it's theirs. They don't have to worry about losing it. It's theirs to own. And I'm going to use this graphic also for the opposition when they say the elderly are going to be fleeing the state. I have talked to a lot of elderly people who have grandchildren and they're terrified that they're gonna to have to leave because they can't afford the property taxes anymore. They're on a fixed income. When you're on a fixed income and the government keeps raising your valuations, how are you supposed to make up the difference? The only way some of these people are gonna do is to leave to states that they don't have income tax, they have lower property taxes. They would love to stay here or move back home to Nebraska to be with their family and their grandchildren. So I don't have, if someone wants to explain to me, well, how this affects the elderly, they're not gonna to wanna to live here, I'd like to hear that rationale. Nebraska taxes are too complicated to change. You're right, they are too complicated. Dan Pilla, who has some great videos on Rob's website, He's the Tax Freedom Institute Executive Director. This is what he said about the federal tax code. People have a right to know what the law requires. We have a tax code that consists of more than 4 million words and has been changed more than 5,900 times since 2001 alone. I wonder what's happened in the last 23 years. And I wonder how that correlates to Nebraska's law. Senator Halloran's gonna talk about that in a little bit. Epic might not work. There's so much fear of the unknown. Everybody has fear of the unknown. What doesn't work? We know that this does not work. 10 to 30% yearly increase in property taxes does not work. What if, what if they keep raising our property taxes? They will. We know that. The Beacon Hill Institute endorses Epic with their dynamic study, and then Art Laffer, the world-renowned economist, said, you're doing the right thing with your tax reform, and I'm totally on board. So what do we do? We need to take action. Calculate your savings under EPIC. On your tables, there is a short a half sheet of paper. It's calculate your EPIC tax savings. And I encourage you to take this home and fill this out and, and see what you would say. So you have here, write down what you pay in vehicle taxes. Write down what you pay in your state income taxes. What do you pay in real estate taxes every year? Or if you're a renter, mm -hmm. take 20% of what you pay in rent each month and then multiply that times 12. That's what you pay in property taxes each year. What do you pay in personal property taxes? <coughs> and what do you pay in sales tax? And you're like, I don't know what I pay in sales tax. I pay that when it's on the receipt and I'm done, I don't know. It's like the invisible hidden tax that we all pay, but we don't know what, how much it is. So take 2% of what your take home is, and that's gonna give you a rough average of what you're paying in sales tax. That's what the current system is. Now go over here. I can tell you, your vehicle tax under Epic will be zero. The state income tax will be zero. The real estate taxes will be zero. The personal property taxes, zero. 
And all you have to fill out is figure out is the epic tax that would replace the sales tax. So take 2% of what you decided over here was your 2% of your, your income or what you're spending on. And then multiply that times about 2.7. That's what you're going to be paying in consumption tax. That's a good estimate. Now, the biggest, most important part is now to put that into your formula. Take your current taxes from here, minus the epic tax over here, and you're gonna calculate your savings. It'll be interesting to see what you come up with. You can go to the epic option website. It's on this QR code, it's also on your literature, on your table. There's all kinds of studies, there's in-depth information, answers a lot of your questions if you wanna do a deep dive. Share this info with friends and family and on social media. Also on the website, there's little short videos you can send around, text around to your family and friends, get them interested in what's going on. Contact your Nebraska state senators. Contact businesses and ag groups. A lot of these are willing to listen. We need to find out why, the, we need to be as loud as the opposition is. Ask them for specifics about why they oppose it. Or how can we convince them to encourage it? Join thousands of Nebraskans and sign the petitions for the Epic Consumption Tax. Christy has petitions on the back bar back there. There's two petitions because we are, our state statute says we have to have a single issue on each ballot, on each petition. So we have two petitions. They work together. One would be to eliminate the, the property taxes, the income taxes, the corporate taxes, and the inheritance taxes. The second petition is to say that there will be no consumption tax on groceries or on used items. Those petitions are equally important because they work together. Let me go back and talk about that for just one more, one more thing. Signing the petitions does not say, yes, I'm voting for this to happen. Signing the petitions allows it to be put on the ballot in November 24 so that Nebraskans as a whole can decide, yes, we'd like to change our constitution to this tax system or not. So if you're not sure, you're on the fence, you can still sign the petition to put it on the ballot and still figure out where you are before November. So we're all taxpayers. Anybody who lives in Nebraska is a taxpayer. I don't care if you're a man, a woman, if you're a Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, if you're a Catholic or a Christian, it doesn't matter. We're all taxpayers. Just imagine what you could do without a heavy tax burden. Just imagine the epic economic boon across all Nebraska for all Nebraskans when you decide how much your taxes are and when you pay them. Epic option. It's your money, it's your future, and it's your Nebraska. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. All right, so now uh, there's a lot of different levels of folks here as far as their level of understanding or their uh, level of knowledge about the epic tax so i'm excited and looking forward to having some questions asked and in the interest of full disclosure i do just want to let some of you know because some of you folks are here hearing about this for the very first time and i just want you to know that there is a lot of controversy there's a lot of opposition to this um, i will say that i've been learning about this for over a year now um, I don't know of any special interest group or any business groups or any accounting groups that are gen gen generally in favor of it. Um, the people who are in favor of it are the people, it seems to me. However, I think that we have uh, a lot of questions and so I feel like the conversation has to be had and it has to be had publicly. We can't have one side put out a piece of information and do a presentation just like we've done today 
And then you all leave here and then another side comes in and does the presentation and says that we're lying or we may look at information that they've put out and say, well, that's just not right. That's not true. So as a taxpayer, it's very frustrating because I'm not an accountant and I'm not an economist. And I really struggle because really smart people on both sides are saying, this is a good idea, this is a bad idea. So what do we do as taxpayers? This is what I want for you tonight is ask the tough questions and we're gonna give you answers. There's some folks here who are gonna be able to answer your questions and then take your questions and go ask the opposition the same questions. But please write down these answers. Please write them down because if someone is speaking an untruth to you, how are you gonna know if you don't write down the answer and do your own research? And this is complicated stuff. I'm not entirely certain where I stand on it. I, I'm supportive of it overall, but I have concerns about the nonprofits and I'm trying to understand how a Concordia University is gonna stay in business if they can't write off their you know, usual non, non, nonprofit write-offs. So hopefully maybe we'll get some insight into that tonight. But please do not let propaganda and do not let someone tell you they're lying, they're lying. If you hear that enough, okay, what's that called? I think somebody said today, a very smart man said, is that called canarding? A canard. A canard. You're getting canarded. <laughs> so let's just keep asking the questions and don't be afraid. Some of you may be really against Epic and I welcome you here, okay? I want you to come to that microphone. Now, when we get to the town hall portion of this, obviously we have some ground rules, okay? We're gonna be professional. We are going to be kind and we're going to be as brief as we can. I want everybody to have a voice. Nobody's gonna take the microphone and go for 20 minutes, okay? We're gonna have time limits. So I'd like to keep it, I, I hate to say a number, but because I don't wanna cut people short, but I think two to three minutes is about uh, enough for you to ask your question or express your opinion, your concerns. And also for our panelists, I'd like to impose a little bit of a limitation there as well. And so if you see me waving at you, or I might come up and kick you, or if I have to, I'll grab the mic. But it's like, take two or three minutes to respond to the question, because there's a lot of people here, and I want to get those questions answered. So again, if you're against it, ask the questions, because folks like me who aren't sure, that we get to learn by, ask, by you asking your tough questions, okay? Um, Senator Halloran, did you want to speak a little bit on the tax code before we jump into the town hall portion of this? Certainly. Okay. I just see this big pile of paper here, and I, I know you carried it a long way, and I, I don't want to disenfranchise well, your message there. Okay. Uh, you got to come to the microphone, though. I, you want me to hold it for you? Oh, okay. Oh, let me bring it to you. This is the early tax code. I'm struggling with this uh, because this is uh, this is chapter 77 of our current tax code. Uh, it's uh, uh, 1270, 1,271 pages, weighs 14 pounds, and this is the summation of what's happened um, over the last 150 years. Um, a Cliff Notes version of our uh, of our history. Okay, I'm gonna put this down because it's. All right, the state was founded in 1867, from 1867 to 1967, 100 years, even 100 years. We had one tax in the state of Nebraska. It was a property tax. Few of you here are old enough to remember that was the case. What happened in 1967? Norbert Tiemann and the legislature passed state income and state sales tax, but they did not rescind the state's ability to tax property taxes to help fund the state. Well, the, the citizens had enough. They're doing what we're doing right now. They did a referendum petition to do away with the state's ability to tax you all property taxes to fund the state. Why? Because they had income tax now. They had sales tax. And it passed overwhelmingly. So the state was stuck then with sales and income tax Local units of government were, were funded by property tax. That stack of paper right there 
is a result from 1967 to today, 1,300 pages of tax code, mostly exemptions here and there. What we do, we pick winners and losers. That's what we do. We don't put that on our campaign card when we campaign, but ultimately when you do the tax code, you pick winners and losers. And when you pick winners and losers, that's a pretty powerful political tool. People don't like to give that up. And so that's why we're getting a lot of resistance on this, is because people don't want to give that power up. I think a very telling thing about this is virtually 100% of the lobbyists in Lincoln are opposed to epic option. Just consider that for a minute. 100% of them are opposed to that. Why would that be? Well, mostly they would be out of business to a great degree. They wouldn't have much work to do because much of the work we do down there is picking winners and losers. I'll keep repeating that until, I'm, until you're tired of hearing that, but it's immoral that we do that. But anyway, that's a Cliff Notes version of our tax code, our tax history. Uh, we're looking, when I ran for the legislature eight years ago, seven and a half years ago, I put on my palm card and on all my material, my platform, guess what my number one bullet point was? Property tax relief. Virtually every senator down there, not all of them, but most of the senators down there were very similar. They ran on property tax relief. Well, it was a wrong subject matter. We should have been talking about, uh, we should have been talking about tax um, reform. reform, thank you. Shouldn't have to talk about tax reform, but we weren't. So I'm gonna make a bet with any and, and any one of you here um, in 30 years, I won't be around to collect that bet, but I'll give you a, a, a note with my heirs on it and you give that bet to my heirs, I'll bet you $100. I'll bet you a farm, okay? I'll bet you a farm that in 30 years, people will be running for the legislature and the number one bullet point on their, on their platform is gonna be Proper, property tax relief. It never stops. We're not gonna fix it in Lincoln. So I encourage you to ask a, a questions and we're gonna do our best to answer those. Thank you. Oh, by the way, you're, you're free to come up and take a look at the tax code. I'll be honest with you, uh, the cover sheet is the official cover sheet. That's 1,300, a blank, 1300 pages of blank paper because I didn't want to waste my ink and my printer on it. So. <laughs> Thanks, Senator. is if, uh, if Rob and uh, the senators could just kind of move up toward the front so that you can hop up onto the mic. You can bring your chairs if you want, just so we're close. Um, again, because we are videotaping, um, rather than just raise your hand, could you come up to this microphone over here, please? And we can go ahead and start. Uh, who would like to be the first to break the ice and ask the first question? simple question. Um, I'm sorry, I was a little bit late, so maybe you talked about this. Do any other states have a consumption tax? And if so, how does that, how is that working for those states? That's a good question. You know, we asked that very question to Art Laffer when he was in my office. And his answer was, and you, and you've seen those, Angie you had those states up there that didn't have any income tax. He said, that's the closest thing that we currently have is those states that don't have income tax that will be the closest thing to having a consumption tax. 
And he said this, he said, those states that have no income tax do better when times are good and they do far better when times are bad. And it's, the sales tax is the best method that they have and that's the closest thing we can have to consumption tax. Let me just share with you a couple of things that's happened in the recent past. And when I mean recent past, I mean like yesterday, okay? Yesterday, the state of Wyoming legislature voted eight to one in the revenue committee, they voted eight to one to eliminate property tax in the state of Wyoming. Florida, last week, introduced a proposal to eliminate property tax in the state of Florida. South Dakota, North Dakota has a petition drive to eliminate property tax in North Dakota. Idaho is doing the same thing. So what is happening across the United States, people are understanding how regressive these taxes are, and they're making a decision to treat people fairly and let them pay the tax they can afford to pay. So when we do this, it will be the place, like I said, the most popular place to live and start a raise a family and start a business. But that's the closest example that we can have. But it's amazing to me to see the other states that have picked up on this. And Wyoming is ahead of the game because it got out of committee, eight to one. And the only reason that it was one vote against it is because what they're doing is, the first year they're going to lower the limit a property tax of 200000 So if your property is 200000 or more, you'll pay property tax on the excess over 200000 And the next year, the second year, it goes to $1 million. So in other words, it'll, re it'll be frozen at $1 million, And the person who voted against that is a person who lives in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where most of the houses are worth more than a $1 million. So we're behind. We're behind all of the states. And the governor has a proposal right now to eliminate or to lower property tax by 40%. So I want you to understand something. When you hear the phrase, property tax relief, what that means is a decrease in the increase. It will not be relief. It'll be you'll pay less than you would have paid if they didn't give you a decrease. And so it won't work what he's trying to do. This is the answer. And most of the time I've told people your property tax aren't high enough yet because if they were high enough, you would do like they did in 66. And in 1966, when they circulated that petition, and I know a gentleman in Sydney that circulated the petition, I asked, did people say to you, what's the state gonna do for money if you eliminate the property tax? And he said they were so fired up about how high their taxes were, they didn't care. And so we are getting to that place. In Scott's Bluff County this year, we nearly had a tax revolt. And so it's an issue that needs to be dealt with today. Because Senator Holland is exactly right. We've been working on this for 57 years, and it's time to take control. But that, that's a long answer, but that's, that's where it is. Okay, next question. Come on, guys, I know you got questions. Even if you have a statement, if you have a statement of concern, come on up. So, right. Go ahead. Right here. Yeah. All right, I'm just going to talk. So this seems really well thought out and well researched, and I, and I know about the petition. And so I'm hearing uh, Governor Pillen seemingly kind of doing a half-hearted version of it with proposing we eliminate property tax and raise the sales tax. Um, I, I can you just give some insight why he seems to be kind of just like, I mean, not, have you had conversations with him? Why is he taking the, like, it seems like a, the general principles, but doing yeah. it totally like half I get it. parted? Yeah, I understand your question. <laughs> yeah. So what has happened is uh, we, have, we visited with him. I tried to talk to him. I talked to his budget director. He understands what we're trying to do. Uh, whether it's, not his idea, or whether he doesn't think it'll work, I'm not sure, but he did tell my staff, he said, the reason that I'm opposed to this, some other state has to do it first. And my question then was, how many states have a unicameral? Anybody know the answer to that one? One. One. So if we're first with the unicameral, can't we be first with the consumption tax? But his proposal, let me talk about what he said. He said last week, he said that the consumption tax would be regressive for low-income people. 
And he said, because you're going to tax low-income people and it's going to be regressive on the things that they buy that they need, the necessities. Consumption tax is not collected on used items and low-income people buy used items. His proposal raises the sales tax from 55 to 6.5%. Does not do away with the sales tax on used items. So you talk about who's going to be regressive for low-income people? It's going to be his plan. And he talks about border bleed. So he's going to take away the exemption. Any of you in agriculture in here? He's going to take away the exemption from ag parts and repairs. That's about $28 million. He's going to take that exemption away from you. So I'm starting a new delivery service called Farm Dash. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you buy the parts from Wyoming, or South Dakota, Iowa, somewhere where they don't charge sales tax on parts, and my company, Door, uh, Farm Dash, is going to deliver those to your farm the next day. I'm going to make some money on this. So he talks about border bleed under the consumption tax. I'll tell you what happens with our current system. Border bleed is when people go across the border, not to shop, but to move. And when Art Laffer was in our office two years ago, he said, you have never gained a person to move to the state of Nebraska from another state greater than the number of people who left. He said, your population grew by those people that come and work in your meat packing plants and the refugees who've been placed here. That's how your population grew. You've not gained one person from another state because your tax code is too high. And so I don't know what his plan is. I haven't seen the plan, but I can tell you this. I have three bills introduced against that amendment. When that bill comes to the floor, I have, I'm going to filibuster that. That is absolutely the wrong way to do property tax relief. He wants to sweep $275 million from all the cash accounts that we have in the middle of a biennium, which means the next time we get the middle of a biennium, any of those agencies that have cash, they're going to spend it. That's not when you make that adjustment. He wants to sweep that $275 million to give you property tax relief. That's a one-time sweeping of the accounts. That's not sustainable. I don't know what he's thinking, but obviously he's not. This is an opportunity for to fix this system once and for all. And I wish he would sit down and talk to me about it, but he has not. But I can tell you right now, his system won't work. And this one will. And we have the information based on what Art Laffer said, as well as the Beacon Hill study. So it, it's amazing to see. It's okay for him to say he's going to have, he, I'm going to have border bleed, but he's not. But I think that farm dash thing will catch on. Thank you for that. Um, anybody else? Somebody's coming up? Take your time. Walk slow. I'm going to switch this up. <laughs> I've got a pretty loud voice. I'm sorry. Is that testimony? Don't go right ahead. It doesn't matter. I noticed on here you said, says uh, as the economy increases and the tax revenue grows due to the epic option, the legislature can vote to decrease the consumption tax percentage. Sure. Given how the legislature is, I would not give them the option that they can. I would put the language in that they are required to reduce it because just the way the government was, they got a pocket full of money. They don't like cutting back. Yeah, I appreciate your answer, uh, your question. Let me let me share how we got to that one. Uh, when Lapper was in my office, I asked him, most of these proposals that you see on the table here today came from our Lapper. Those were suggestions that he gave us on how to implement the distribution. And what he told me is this. He said in California, when they implemented Prop 13, their, their, sale, their property tax was 2.5%. And when Prop 13 went into effect, it lowered it to 1%. And he said, everyone in the state said the schools are going to close, the roads are going to fall apart, we're not going to have any funding for police, it was all going to happen all at once. He said at the end of two years, they collected more money at 1% than they did at 25 It's because the economy exploded. He said, so whatever you start out at, whatever it's 6 or 7 or whatever the percentage is, make sure you can adjust it down. Because he said, as the economy picks up, what you don't want to have is more money than you need. And let me explain why that's important. Because last year, and last year I'm on the Appropriations Committee, last year we had $2 billion in excess funds that we needed to distribute. 
We had requests in the Appropriations Committee for $4 billion. That was a difficult process, going through all of those bills and deciding which ones got the funding, which ones didn't. In 17, when Senator Hauer and I arrived at the legislature, we were a billion one in the hole. That Appropriations Committee meeting was easy, really easy. It was no, no, and hell no, okay? So I can tell you, it's far easier to make hard decisions when you don't have any money. He said, do not lock it in so that it can't, he said, make it difficult to change it, but don't make it so you can't change it, because he said you'll have more revenue than you need, and he said you should never have more money in your coffers than you need to run the government, because that money belongs to the people. So I understand what you're saying. So we need to make it difficult to change it, but it needs to be changeable. Rob, do you have any comments that you wanted to share? You seem like you are maybe had something. <laughs> I don't really have a whole lot, uh, unless somebody has more questions. But I can tell you that there is one great advantage to consumption taxation. It is the only form of taxation that puts a hard lid on what the government can tax. And I'll, I'll go into that just a little bit, right? So under the current law, we have any, any no, I don't, should I be real partisan? No, I, anybody remember Rush Limbaugh? <laughs> Do you remember how he talked about confiscatory taxation? You know what that confiscatory taxation is? It's the property tax and the income tax. The tax takes your money. This is a church. How many think the government is complying with the Ten Commandments when they do this? Anybody? No, there's just this little thing about not stealing. What is confiscatory taxation? It's legalized stealing. That's one of the things, as a rel relatively devout Christian myself, that motivates me. I've read the Bible through at least three times, and I've never found the part that says it's okay for the government to steal, just not anybody else. This is a moral issue. When, Dan, when, when Angie said this is a, a moral issue, she's absolutely right. That's why the consumption tax or even a sales tax, the tax is what you spend. And what, what, why Senator Ehrman's statement about spending money <laughs> sending you the bill, you spend money and they live on it is so important. It restores your property rights. That's one of the things that our country was founded on. Thank you. Uh, from the opposition, one of the things I've heard is that seven and a half percent isn't near enough. It's going to be 17. How sure are you that seven and a half is going to cover what the state of Nebraska needs? I've heard that numerous times. What is surprising to me. I did an interview on the TV, with the TV reporter a couple months ago, and he said, you've done something that no one else has ever done. I said, what is that? He said, you've brought the Democrats, the Republicans, the liberals, the conservatives, the ag groups, the urban people, all against you on one thing. No one's ever done that before. And it's because we're taking away their right to pick winners and losers. So the 17%, I'll tell you how they got to that. We did a Beacon Hill study, which is a dynamic study, which figures out how much advantage you're gonna have when you change the way you tax people, because changing the way you tax people changes behaviors. They studied it, they said the advantage the first year will be $27 billion in increased revenue. So you take away the exemptions as Angie spoke about. You add the increased economic advantage for having the consumption tax. The base goes to 162 billion. And if you take our current tax code and you just divide that into the number of dollars we need, you get 17%. And so they did it on the back of an envelope. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why Open Sky, who is a liberal think tank, has put that information out there, and the governor and the Chamber of Commerce and everyone else has bought into what a liberal think tank has come up with as the, as the percentage. And I can tell you this, we have worked with Ernie Goss, who's an economist at, at Creighton University, right? 
We asked Ernie Goss his opinion about the consumption tax. And here's what he said. He didn't do a complete dynamic study, but he said, I can guarantee you that if you missed it, the rate would never ever even get to 15. But I can tell you right now, if it was 15, if it was, you're better off at 15% under the consumption tax than you are under our current system. So that is the information they're putting out there. Everybody's singing from the same hymnal that Open Sky put together, and it's working. It's working because people are believing a lie. The truth is, on epicoption.org, the Beacon Hill study is there. It's a very simple read. It's about 27 pages. It explains exactly what we're doing how they got arrived at the numbers they got that they arrived at and what the percentage will be. And you'll see in the study it says the rate should be 7.23. And the reason we put in 7.5 is because the difference between 7.23 and 7.5 is $400 million. Now, that is a cushion for us to land smoothly in the 26 when we start this. The other issue that we didn't speak about is we collect property tax and income tax a year in arrears, correct? The property tax you're going to pay in May is for 25, 24, right? So when we get into 26, we'll be collecting income tax and property tax from 25. We'll be able to fill up those funds that we need to fill up to make sure that we meet all the needs of all of the units of government. And so we have thought through this on how to make this an easy landing that everybody will get all the revenue they currently get. And I understand the nonprofits are concerned about this. I understand that. But I can tell you right now, as we continue to move down this path of taxing you right out of your home, right out of your business, this is not the state you want to stay living in. And so if we don't do this, at some point in time, maybe we won't get it this time, I'm going to tell you something, we will have to do this. Because if Wyoming does it, if North Dakota does it, if Florida does it, you'll have no choice. You'll have no choice. They will leave here like grounded rats. I'm serious. This is, this is, and I was concerned about those other states picking up on this. Wyoming is already way ahead of us. They don't have any income tax. Neither does Florida. So we have to fix this, and we have to fix it now. And, and I, understand, I understand what change is. And Ronald Reagan once said, the only way to manage change is to create it. And so I hope <coughs> you understand that as well. Senator Holland. Yeah, thank you, Steve. We talk about dynamic studies and static studies quite a bit. And okay, so what's the difference, right? Uh, let me give you a, a metaphoric example of that. Uh, static study is a photo in time. It's a narrow snapshot uh, in time. And a dynamic study is a wider range period of time, a video. So I know you're all fans, have been fans of the Husker volleyball team. An example of static study for the, uh, girl, uh, the women's volleyball team would be this. If you took a snapshot of a serving error that Nebraska made during a game, you took a snapshot of that serving error and you said, okay, static study, predict how the game's gonna turn out. Well, we just gave them a point, we're probably gonna lose. A dynamic study would be starting a film from the very first set through the second set, watching the dynamics of the offense and the defense, both teams, see how they interact, see how they score, and make a projection of how the rest of the game, the rest of the sets are gonna go. That's the difference between a static point in time and a dynamic study projecting the impact of, of the future. So, um, real, real, real quickly, uh, I introduced a bill, should I talk to him about my bill? I introduced a bill today in revenue and it was out of my nature to do it, but I wanted to make a point. The bill was this. Uh, it was an introduction of a 12% tax, income tax, on unrealized gains. On unrealized gains. What that means is, is if we would be taxing, we would be taxing your uh, stock portfolio, your dividends, whatever you have in stocks or bonds uh, during a year's time. So if your stocks went up, if you had a $20,000 portfolio and it went up $10,000, we would charge you 12% times that $10,000 increase. You didn't sell your stock, but we would charge you 12% times that. What do you think of that? Sucks, right? Stupid. 
It is stupid. And I, and I propose that bill to make the point that it's stupid. You didn't sell your stock. You didn't realize actually any profit from it. You didn't sell it, so you shouldn't be taxed on it, right? The point I was making is, is that's what we've done in property taxes for the last 55 plus years. Each year you get a, you get a property tax statement and you show your valuations typically gone up, right? Has it ever gone down for you? Show of hands, no. So it goes up every time, and consequently times the levy, your, your property tax statement goes up. So what have we done there? We've taxed you on an unrealized gain. Same thing, we've taxed you on an unrealized gain. Worse than that, we not only taxed you on an unrealized gain, you didn't sell your property. So you didn't realize any gain, we are not only taxing on an unrealized gain, we're taxing you over and over again each consecutive year on the value of that property. No, it's wrong. So I propose that tax, knowing full well that the committee's not gonna advance it to the floor because it's a stupid bill. But I wanted to point out the fact that they're stupid for not recognizing that's what we do with property taxes. We're taxing you on an unrealized gain. You're not selling your property. So there's no gain there to tax. Why are we increasing your taxes? Okay? Something to think about. I wish it would make it to the floor or so. Now we had one liberal on the on the revenue committee. He looked at the uh, the fiscal statement. Usually a fiscal statement has a, a figure with parentheses around it, meaning it's a loss or a cost to the state. This one had no parentheses around it. Uh, it was a $3.8 billion increase in revenue. Well, trust me, I'm a conservative. I don't want that bill, but I don't want the type of property taxes or the, the means of, of, of measuring taxes on the property that we do now. It's, it's not right, it's immoral, it's unethical, but we continue to do it. Thank you. I want to point, just a, a point of information. Uh, so when Senator Urban talked about the rate possibly being more and our, our, our opponents are accusing us of having a 15% or more rate. Even if we're wrong, even if the rate's nine, eight, eight and a half, nine and a half, even 10%, and doc, you're right, he's right, Dr. Goss said it won't, it won't be 15%, but it won't be more than 10%. And every economist, he pointed out, makes different assumptions, but he said the Beacon Hill assumptions were reasonable. But here's something about the nature of whatever increase in sales tax we're going to propose. The flash, inside information, you're already paying that because every business that pays tax becomes part of their expenses, right? How do they recoup those expenses, including their employee salary that they're paying property tax on their homes and farms? How do they recoup it? They recoup it through the price they charge for their product. So their customers absorb it when they buy it. The wholesaler absorbs, the retailer absorb, pays that cost when they buy it. Where does the retailer get its funds to pay that hidden tax? They get it from you. So we're not adding new taxes. We're simply taking taxes you're already paying and making them visible. Hi there, thank you Angie for your presentation. I thought it did a great job of kind of showing the big picture of how this works across the state of Nebraska. And I'm hoping that the panel will indulge me in a more specific scenario and just help, help me understand how it would work uh, in a situation, a nonprofit situation like this church. So uh, I'm a member of this church um, in, in the leadership and I know that uh, our church like many nonprofits and many churches or uh, nonprofit schools uh, in the in the state, just barely make it. We just barely meet our budget every year, or we don't. And if we have an incident uh, that pops up, like a, a large hailstorm that breaks out all the windows and the roofs, and you have a large insurance deductible uh, to pay, or you have uh, five-fold increase in your insurance premiums, all of a sudden you're, you're set saying, this is, this is a tremendous threat 
to our existence. Um, so talk me through how we can, and I understand there's kind of that two year window. I appreciate your example from the landlord on the renters. And like in two years, this might rectify itself, but in two years, churches like The Rock or other nonprofits across the state may not be around. There will be a certain percentage of them that may not be able to survive a couple years till this sort of equalizes. That's my that's my assertion. I'm just asking you, can you help me talk talk about it? Yeah, let me take a shot at that. So first thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna have to pay a consumption tax on those things you consume. And what might that be? You might buy paper for your printer, right? You may buy food if you have a, a people come in to buy food, there'll be no tax on the food because it's not prepared food. So there'll be no tax on your food. So what other items, let me ask you, what items do you think you would pay consumption tax on that you are now currently not paying tax on? Would we pay uh, consumption, I'm, quite, I'm asking, yep, would we pay good. consumption tax on things like insurance premiums? No. Would we pay consumption tax on services like security, internet, fire alarms, uh, repairs to a, 19, a building that was built in 1915. So when you when you buy things now, do you get exempt from sales tax? Yes. Okay. So you, you may have consumption tax on those. Let's talk about your insurance premium. That's an important one. So what has happened is we've met with the insurance industry, their lobbyists, and uh, Mr. Bell has been in my office numerous times. The insurance premium tax is an excise tax. And currently in the state of Nebraska, we have the best excise tax for insurance, the best premium tax in the nation. That's why the headquarters for all state, State Farm, Mutual of Omaha, all the insurance companies are in the state of Nebraska because we have the best tax advantage for insurance companies. So when you say best tax, you mean most lucrative for the insurance company. That's correct. Okay, yes. So you're paying, the premium tax is your tax on your insurance premium. The only thing you pay consumption tax on is your deductible, whatever your deductible is. And so you would have some costs there that you would have no matter what. You have, you have some tax, you'd still have to pay the deductible, you'd have a tax on that. But let me share with you what happens. And Andy brought it up, Angie brought it up on her slide right there. So if you reduce the tax burden on the parishioners, those people who attend the church, right? You reduce that by 80%. They will have more money to contribute to your church than they have now. Because what is happening today, I'll tell you what's happening today. I met with a banker last week or two weeks ago when I was home. And he said, what's happening to people now with their houses and their mortgage payment is their insurance premiums have gone up. Their taxes have gone up. They had X amount of dollars to pay their mortgage taxes and insurance. So to be able to stay in their house, what they're doing is they're raising their deductible to $10,000. So when they raise their deductible to $10,000, their premium goes down. But what the banker said is, here's what happens. We have a hailstorm, as you described, or something comes through. They're only going to repair what the insurance is going to pay for. And a $10,000 deductible, that damage is going to stay there. So they come to the bank to borrow the money to do the $10,000 repair that's a deductible. And the bank doesn't want to loan them that money because it puts them above what they're able to pay but they don't have a choice because if the bank forecloses on them, they've got to fix the 10,000 anyway. So that's a situation we're putting ourselves in. So when we take away that burden of the income tax and the property tax, those people can afford to live in their house and they'll have more money to make a contribution to your church. And so that's the best answer I can give you. But I can tell you right now that if we keep going like we're going now, people aren't gonna have any money to give to your church because they're taking it to pay their mortgage and their taxes and insurance. And so there'll be, there'll be some of that that's different for nonprofits and churches, and that will work itself out. I don't know that Angie, on her two-year example, is exactly right. I have rental properties, and what will happen in my community, I have a tenant that's been there for 12 years, 
same tenant, 12 years, outstanding tenant, pays on, on time, not a problem. A lot of people in Bridgeport would like to have that tenant. They're going to lower their rent so they can attract tenants like mine. If I want to keep that tenant, I'm going to have to make sure that I'm competitive with others. And when others are able to lower their rent because their property tax went away, I will have to as well. And so that's the issue that we're dealing with, and it's a fundamental change in the way we look at things when you make nonprofits pay consumption tax. But there's no other way to do this without allowing exemptions. If we start with one exemption, we'll wind up where we are with the ones we have now. That's how we got them. We gave one. And so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my perception of it. It helps. May I ask a follow-up question that, Go ahead. that relates to Concordia, yes, uh, which is our local university here. Um, so Concordia is unique in the state in that it uh, typically brings in more than 60% of its students from outside the state. So right. we are, unlike most of the other institutions in the state, a sort of a brain gain institution where we're drawing in talented people from outside the state who often stay. But, uh, so I, this will all probably work out for Nebraskans, um, but if we have to manage the, the budget at, at Concordia um, and the people from, who are coming from out of state don't benefit from the, the epic tax right. and still have to pay higher tuition, uh, that's gonna have, that's gonna put some real pinches on enrollment and, and the ability of an institution like Concordia to continue to serve uh, those students. I understand. Well, can I ask you a question? Why will they have to pay higher tuition? Somehow we have to bring in enough revenue to cover an additional seven and a half to 10% or more uh, expenses. On what? On, any, on anything that we have to pay on. Okay, we're not taxing education. Concordia, we just finished a $25 million building three years ago. We just finished a $20 million new building. I'm assuming those building projects would now be instead of 20 million, 22 and a half or something like that. Do you pay property tax? No. Because you're a school. Is that correct? That's correct, nonprofit. Okay, so seven and a half percent. How often do you build a $20 million building? Uh, uh, <laughs> Depends. <laughs> Yeah, there's some of those things that are gonna happen. I understand that. And, and that is not what we want to see happen, but it's one of those things that if we, as I said earlier, if we begin to give an exemption for one, we gotta give it for another, and that's how we got the 61 billion today is currently exempt from sales tax, is because we gave one exemption. The state of South Dakota has one, one sales tax exemption in the whole state. Everything else pays sales tax. But, but I understand I understand your comment. So we have to be able to understand that those people that are coming here will want to stay here because of our tax system. And I would hope that those people that then are contributing to your college will have more money to contribute because they're not paying all these taxes as well. That would be, that would be the, the example that I would give you. But, but it is, is a situation where it's going to be different for different folks, for different people, for nonprofits. But it's a situation that we have to make a decision about what's best for the whole, the whole state. And, and if you don't think that this system is broken, just wait till you see what happens in the future. Because as Senator, Senator Holleran said, they're taxing your unrealized gains, but not only that, they're taxing your whole investment. And so we've got to make a decision. I understand that. And I guess my only, my concern, and I'll, I'll wrap it up with this, is I just don't want nonprofits in the state to be the casualties of this while we move from from the current state right. to the future state. I'm, I'm with you all the way. I, I, I agree with you. And and uh, churches and those kind of things, those, those entities that help people do what they should do and live the way they should live are very important, very important. Thank you. I, I, I couldn't underscore uh, Senator Irvin's sentiments about nonprofits and how important they are, but I, but I also can't underscore enough. I talk to people about, from time to time, we have fundraising uh, issues at our church and schools and, and, and such. And I'll have people come up to me and say, well, I'll tell you what, Senator Halloran, I don't need to be charitable. I pay my taxes. 
and the government does my charity for me. No, that's not charity. You know that, right? We all here know that. But the fact of the matter is our disposable income has, has become smaller and smaller and smaller over time. We're being taxed out of our disposable income, which would uh, ordinarily be very appealing for people to donate to nonprofits, and they should. So I would just underscore that again. Uh, this, this frees up a lot of disposable income back to individuals that'd be more than willing to pay uh, to a nonprofit to keep supporting your efforts. I'm gonna ask a question just real quick. Is it true that if this were to get on the ballot and the citizens of Nebraska vote for it, isn't that just kind of the beginning because the LB79 or AM314, the way it's written right now, that's sort of the starting point. And that bill then would have to still go to the legislature and have all the details debated and worked out. So what we're voting for is to, or what we're signing for is to get it on the ballot. Right. And then what we're voting for is to have it, but then the legislature still has to go through all the details and make it happen. That's, right. That's correct. Now, and let me just say this. The reason we, we put in 79 and then we amended with 314 was to have that discussion on the floor of the legislature to work out all these details and have it in place so when people voted in 24, they knew what was gonna happen in 26. That is our impression, that's our first impression of how to do the distribution and the collection, and we got most of those ideas from our platform. Those will be massaged and put in place. Let me just share with you what happened in 66. In 1966, the voters eliminated property tax for the state, which was their only source of revenue. When they arrived in 1967, the legislature implemented sales and income tax and wrote all the codes for those two taxes. We have made a provision to start with something to work from. They never had that in 66. So when they did that, they figured it out. I would assume that in 26, when we go to do this, there'll be smart people in the legislature that'll be able to figure out how to make this work and make sure that everybody gets all the money that they're supposed to get. Because you see, in my district, I have three counties that have no consumption tax. Zero. You can't even buy a loaf of bread or a gallon of milk. So they're going to have to get their revenue from the state. And as I said earlier, the state distributed money for 100 years when they collected it all up until 1967 and sent it back. We can do it again. But that's the issues that we need to deal with, and you're exactly right. That's why it was important for us to get... See, I'll be 77 to the floor to have those discussions. We were not able to do that. And the reason we weren't able to do that because Senator Holland described those 1,271 pages, pick winners and losers, and those people that serve in that big, tall building in Lincoln love to pick winners and losers, okay? And this affords them the opportunity to do that, and the consumption tax does not. So if they're gonna take away your authority to do what you've always done and what you like to do, and you have to listen to the people, they don't like that. And so that's why the bill never got the floor. But we'll adjust it. It'll be adjusted. And they did it in 67. They figured it out. We'll figure it out again. Thank you. Uh, realtor here. Um, okay. Um, I haven't really made it. Um, I don't know if I'm for it or against it. I guess I've got some concerns right now that I, if you could answer for me. Um, so... Um, and I wrote these out here. It's kind of a three-part question. Um, so three of the largest owners of real estate in Nebraska are the Mormon Church, the federal government, and Bill Gates. Um, under EPIC, they would have zero tax liability, if I'm understanding this right. And um, in, my, in my view, I guess that shifted then to the Nebraska taxpayer because they're not living here, so they're not paying taxes right. on anything that they consume, anything that they buy. Um, anything like that. Um, so it feels to me like that's a shift of, of taxation to the Nebraska residents. Can somebody tell me how much tax money would be forgiven from out-of-state landowners um, that would need to be paid by Nebraska residents? Has anybody ever looked into that? The exact number? I don't know. Yeah. That. 
you have an idea. What's, what's, your, what's your third question? Then I'll, I'll try uh, to answer. Well, this that. kind of goes with that. Um, I've got clients that kind of live on the state line, uh, kind of in northern Nebraska, um, South Dakota border, and they own like a commercial property in their small town. They own their acreage out in the country, and then they own um, land, actually rental properties here in Seward. Mm -hmm. um, they have told me that if this passes, they will move to the other side of the line into South Dakota and then have zero tax liability here in Nebraska and still be able to look, you know, own that land, which of course would have to be picked up by Nebraska taxpayers. So I guess I'm wondering, has that been studied? Has anything been looked into as far as what tax liability is gonna be given up by out-of-state people that aren't paying into our state but it's going to have to be picked up by the residents here. Yeah. Okay. Let's start with let's start with the first one about Bill Gates and the Mormon Church and Ted Turner. Let's start with those. Uh, Ted Turner is not in good health. Okay? <laughs> he, he's serious. I'm serious. He's not in good health, and he visited Mayo Clinic several years ago, and they didn't give him a long time to live. When Ted Turner dies, he's going to convert that land to nonprofit organizations who are not going to pay taxes. His taxes are going to go away. Bill Gates very well will do the same thing. So those who are concerned about Bill Gates and Ted Turner not paying taxes, get ready. Because when they do that, when they transfer that to a nonprofit and they take it off the tax rolls under our current system, you're going to pay more. So the inevitable is going to come. They're not going to pay any tax whether we pass this or not. So the issue I had with the lady in Ogallala, she paid $60,000 in property tax. And she called me and she said, I don't like the fact that Ted Turner is not gonna pay tax. And I said, we're gonna save you $60,000. Do you care if Ted Turner pays taxes if we pay you $60,000, we reduce your taxes by 60,000? She said, yes. I said, think about what you just said. We're gonna reduce your tax liability by 60,000 and you're upset that Ted Turner is not going to pay anything. I'd be tickled to death if they reduced my tax liability by 60000 and Ted Turner didn't pay any. So I don't know that that's an issue that we should be concerned about who's going to pay that Ted Turner tax or not because he's not going to. And the other issue was those people are going to live on the border and they're going to move to South Dakota. They may move to Nebraska. They may move to Nebraska because they're not going to have any property tax and they live in South Dakota, they have property tax. They don't have income tax, but they still have property tax. And so we talk about border bleed, and we talk about those people that go across the border to do things. How many of you have neighbors that have South Dakota license plates on their vehicles? Anybody? It's prevalent in my area. People go to South Dakota and they license their vehicle. They live in Nebraska. We already have cheating, all right? And there's gonna be cheaters no matter how we put this together. That's the Department of Revenue's job to look up and see who's cheating and who isn't. But the issue with those people moving to South Dakota, people will tell you a lot of things, but they talk with their money. And when their money is that we don't have property tax or income tax in Nebraska, they were about very well may move on this side of the border, not that side. And I don't know why one would want to move to South Dakota and have their property in Nebraska when their consumption tax is going to be an insignificant amount of their total income. Why would you want to live in South Dakota? That doesn't make any sense. What was your third question? I think I missed part of it. Well, um, so my, my next question is kind of separate from that. Um, so I'm a realtor and um, yeah, new construction, I think we were talking about this a little bit earlier that you might hit on this. You know, if people do a new build, then you're looking at anywhere from probably 35,000 on up to $100,000 in tax on the epic tax on a new build, which most people can't do. So I guess, how is that going to be handled so that that does not affect our cause of housing shortage and all kinds of economy, you know, economy problems across the state? Well, first of all, uh, your comment about 100,000 or 80,000, whatever it was, is incorrect. I'll give you an example. This is a pretty, example, pretty good example. I think it's easy to understand. Today, if you buy a home in Lincoln, Nebraska, a $300,000 home, probably 50, 60% of that home is material. Is that a fair assumption? You can't build a house for that now. I mean, 400,000 is about the minimum that you could build. Let's use 300,000 as an okay. example. 
How much of the three hundred thousand dollar house is material? I don't know the exact. Number. Sixty. Let's say sixty percent, forty percent labor. So a three hundred thousand dollar house. That means that contractor that built that house paid sales tax on one hundred eighty thousand dollars, right? So when he sells the house for three hundred thousand, it includes the sales tax he paid on the material. It's hidden in the price. Under the consumption tax, you'll pay consumption tax on the labor and the material. So let's use that as an example. Let's take the thirteen thousand five hundred that we pay in sales tax and subtract that from the thirteen thousand for the three hundred thousand. Now we're at two eighty seven. Now we're going to add back the consumption tax of seven and a half percent. That three hundred thousand dollar house is going to cost three hundred and eight thousand under the consumption tax. Not three eighty, not four hundred, but three hundred and eight. The consumption tax will not have a property tax. So the first year that they own that home in Lincoln, Nebraska, I don't know what the mill levy is in Seward, but the first year they own that home in Lincoln, Nebraska, the property tax is gonna be $6,500. The next year, anybody know what it's gonna be the next year? 7,000 under our current system? 7,500, right? It goes up. All right, let's take that example. So I said, the house under the current system we purchased at 300,000 with a $6,500 tax liability. Under the consumption tax is 308,000. How many years of paying $6,500 in property tax does it take to pay off $8,500 more in cost? Anyone do the math? Year and a half? Year and a half. So in a year and a half, you've paid off the extra cost of the consumption tax compared to our current system. A year and a half. When your mortgage is paid under our current system, how long do you have to pay that before you own it? You never own it. You never own it. You continue to rent from the government. The government's your landlord and they don't like you. They keep raising your rent. So when you talk about not buying a new house under the consumption tax, if I was gonna buy a new house and pay 308,000 and when I paid the mortgage, I owned it, and all I had to pay was $8,000 more than the purchase price, and I never had to pay any more top property tax, that's a deal. I do that all day long. So I don't know who's been telling you about the consumption tax, how much it's gonna to cost to buy a house, but we don't take into consideration the hidden taxes that is in a current home when you buy a new home. And that is the example, that's the truth, that's how it works. So is it not seven and a half percent on 300,000? Yes, it is. So it'd be 321,000? No, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. Because you, didn't, you missed what I said. The house is, is 300,000. In that 300,000 is 13,500 in sales tax that the contractor paid on the material he built the house with. But he will that goes that away. On. I mean, he's no, not gonna that, pay that. That, that goes away. That, he don't have that tax anymore. He does right. not pass. He does not pay any consumption tax when he buys the material because it's a business to business transaction. So he doesn't add any tax to the price of, of the home. He sells it to you for what he paid for, 287,000. Then you add the 21,000 in consumption tax and you get to 308,000. That's how you do it. You don't add the 21,000 to the 300,000 because you didn't subtract the sales tax. Okay. The problem's gonna be in the pre-approval. It's gonna, cause you can't build a house for 300,000. I know that's a million. Okay, use 400,000. Use 400,000. Well, like care. on a 700,000 dollar house, which a lot of them are probably between five and six. I'd say between four and six. Four is the minimum you can build for. Same example. You're looking at $49,000 on a $700,000 house. You don't think that will keep people no. from the building? No, because you're, it's the same. It's a percentage of the value. And so a $700,000 house, if it has 60% of that house is material, that's $420,000 times a 7.5% sales tax. You subtract that off the price, then you add the consumption tax back, the $700,000 house could be $725,000. You don't have to pay the sales tax because the contractor doesn't have to pay the sales tax. It's the same example, whether it's 300 or a million or 400,000, it's all the same. The fact that remains, you're buying a new house under the consumption tax is so much better than buying it under a current system because you actually own your property when it's paid for and you don't now. You keep renting from the government. So don't let people try to tell you that under the consumption tax model, you won't buy new homes because that's not the case. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm sure you've heard this one before from the, uh, all the school uh, state formula, how, how all that's figured. I spent 12 years on the Seward School Board, um, and most of, a lot of our taxes to fund the school district came from local taxes. Now, I, I own a little bit of property, uh, some rental property and some commercial property and some farm ground. So I get that about paying taxes because I pay probably around $35,000 a year just in property taxes. Um, how do you convince people that look at their tax statement and go, oh, I, I owe $6,000 to the government, to Seward County, but yet they don't realize that 60, 70, 80% of that goes to the school district because we tax so high for the school district. How do you convince people that this is a good thing when all that money is right there for the school district? I, I, maybe I'm not explaining it. How, okay, so you, you mentioned that you'll be a year in the rear on the taxes, but then there's some other things that are gonna come into play for like the school districts and things like that. Okay. So how do you convince people that they're gonna be okay with getting money from the state right. to fund the school districts without the property tax is what I'm trying to say. You wanna start with the school? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Okay, let me explain that. So what I meant by you collect taxes in arrears is the money that's gonna be collected in the beginning of 26 will be from the income tax and the property tax that's owed in 25. Right. And that will be added to those three funds we talked about to make up for schools that have increase in student population they have a disaster or something like that. We'll have three pots of money for schools and counties to draw from. All right, so they will get the same amount of money the first year. This is not a drag on the school. The money will be there the first year for the schools. We had three superintendents of schools work with us on the formula to distribute this money. And here's what they said. If you can tell me as a superintendent on July 1st what my budget will be for the following year, that's a big advantage over to what I have now because you know as being on the school board, you don't know exactly what your tax receipts are gonna be until they set the value, which is the last week in September, right? It's a yeah, so the superintendent said, if you can tell me on July 1 what my budget's gonna be, that's a great advantage. And under the consumption tax, they'll be able to tell because we have a new formula. We're doing away with Teosa. We're gonna base it on objective things. Every school has a class and a teacher. They get so much money for that. They have special ed, they get so much money for that. They have reduced lunches, they get so much money for that. Distance traveled, all of those things are objective. So the superintendent can calculate exactly what their budget's gonna be by the number of students they have in each one of those categories or what their needs are. We will distribute that on a monthly basis. And when the superintendent said, if you can make a distribution to us monthly, instead of twice a year, that's a big advantage for me budgeting. And so they were all in when we decided how the money was gonna be distributed monthly and how it was gonna be accounted for so they could know they were gonna get everything they're supposed to get. Those superintendents were on board. And those superintendents who sat down and listened to what we're trying to do and tried to help us make this so it works, understood that this is a formula they can understand because I don't know anybody in this room, including Senator Holler or myself, that understands the formula we currently have. The only person I know on the face of the earth that knows that is Mike Groney and he's no longer in the legislature. It is the most convoluted, confusing formula anybody could come up with. My school system this year at home lost $450,000 under the formula we currently have when we gave a billion dollars more to school, 350 million more to school, public school education, and they lost money because the formula worked out in their disadvantage. So that's the advantage we're gonna have. We have a formula set up to distribute the money so they get everything they're supposed to get. We also included a 2% increase. We had a 2% increase for the schools the first year because we have no idea what inflation is gonna be. So we wanted to try to cover some of those expenses covering the inflation. So that, that's our goal. Our goal is to make everybody held harmless. Every local unit of government's gonna get every dollar they currently get. That's how, do you, how do you communicate that to people when you're talking about the epic tax though? I mean, how do you simplify that to calm their nerves that, you know, it's all about the children. We hear that all the time. Um, I agree. 
But how do you how do you calm people's nerves when when they look at uh, the, the schools and go, hey, there's not going to be any money there? Well, what I'm about to say may not resonate with you, but it's a truth. I have yet to have a discussion with somebody who's not really interested in finding out the truth and making a decision based on the truth. And those who have already made up their mind that they're not changing their mind, there's nothing I've ever said to change their mind. And I've answered questions for people till I'm blue in the face. I stood at the state fair and answered questions for a guy for 30 minutes. And when I got done, I said, does that make sense? He said, yeah, I'm not interested. So I've never explained it to anybody who was in opposition, has made their mind up that they're not gonna accept this, that they change their mind after answering their questions. But I can tell you right now that when I signed up for this job back in 16, I put on my business card, my handout, that I was going to work on property tax relief. I wish I had never done that. Because I try to be a man of my word and do what I said. And so for the last seven and a half years, we've been working on trying to fix the tax system. Because that's what I said I was going to do. I haven't accomplished it yet. But I'm not giving up. Because I made a decision to help the voters of my district live better than they did before I came there. And so whatever it takes, we gotta do that to make sure that people understand it. And to answer your question, I don't know how you convince people that don't wanna be convinced. But the truth is the truth, and the example that I've given is the best way to describe it. Thank you. Uh, you know, Mark, Mark Twain always had a way with words and expressions, right? He, he had an expression that I think applies here a little bit. And Angie alluded to it in, in her first presentation a little bit. It's so hard to chase a lie and catch up with it and correct it. It just is. Mark Twain, Mark Twain didn't say that. I, I said that, you can quote me on that. But Mark Twain said, a lie will travel halfway around the world before the truth puts on its slippers. That's so true. Because a lie can create a lot of fear, anxiety, distrust, disbelief, and then you just pound your head against that wall trying to correct that lie. It's tough, it is hard to do. Um, and maybe Senator Erdman's right. Is, is, this is a, a question I think I know the answer to, but are you fully equalized here at your school? Fully equalized? I haven't been on board for a number of years. So Chances are not. Probably not. I mean, it's mostly funded by property taxes. Right. Well, the beauty of the consumption tax here is, is that we would, we would finally be in compliance with our state constitution. Our state constitution, in clear language, uh, spells out that the state is obligated for free K-12 through education, right? Well, that means the state should be contributing through sales and income tax, or whatever form of revenue they have, and after consumption tax, it would be consumption tax. But the state is obligated by the Constitution to fund your schools. Not you all, property owners. They don't, though. <laughs> well, they don't, but that's, but, but, that, but, but that's what the consumption tax will fix, right? Because they'll only have one source of income, and it's revenue neutral. It's going to generate the same amount of revenue. All those taxes that are going away generates. It's just a different source of revenue, right? So how, how many senators are on board with this? 57. <laughs> oh no, there's only 49 senators. <laughs> the, the, uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's like when Obama said he visited all 57 states, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I don't know what Joe said, but, but anyway, uh, the first year we brought this to the floor of the legislature, we had 19 votes, and the second year we brought it to the legislature, we had 20. And it takes 25 to advance from general file to select. Uh, we didn't have 25. Uh, to get it on the ballot would take 30. The constitutional amendment takes 30 to get it on the ballot. So that's kind of where we're at. So uh, we've gained some support. Uh, Senator Wayne from Omaha has always been a supporter. Uh, Senator Wayne understands what it means for his district. Uh, he has a lot of low income people in his district and uh, Senator Wayne has been very supportive. And so uh, the people that have taken the time to sit down and listen to us, to sit down and ask the questions, and get their questions answered and try to understand what we're trying to do, have been on board. And so uh, whatever issues they have for not doing it, I don't know what they are, but but there is support there. You have a question? Yep, he's got one right here. I wanna ask real quick, 
would you be open to having a panel, build, putting together a panel to debate in a public forum, the Chamber of Commerce? Because the Chamber of Commerce for, from the state, the state Chamber of Commerce is, seems to be at the, uh, at the root of a lot of the information in opposition. They go around and do presentations all over the state and they're, they're pushing information down through the chambers, which then goes out to the businesses and goes out to the community. Yep. Would you anytime, debate? Anytime, any place. Okay, thank you. All right, so I have a few points, questions, or all that, so I appreciate the economics of it. Uh, with Art Moore, or Art Laffer, Stephen Moore, I'm more of a Milton Friedman, Henry Hazlitt type of economist. Okay. Um, so, basically, in looking at the numbers, with the first year proposal in 2026, is 11.6 billion in revenue coming from the epic tax. What's the current revenue now that the state's working with? Because, I mean, we're really looking at locals and municipalities right. coming from this pool, education coming from this pool, state government coming from that pool. What's the current revenues or what's the current numbers that yeah, we're really I, looking at? I think the annual budget is just over $10 billion now. 10, okay. 10 3 or something. Okay. And then going through that, like I said, this is them collecting the money, then spending it. Is balanced budget requirement part of this to where that's all they can spend? Yes, yes. So what we're gonna do, let me let me uh, loot on that, uh, spread that out for you. Sure. Uh, all the current statutes on the 2.5% increase in spending that a local unit of government can do, but a 3.5% with the majority board of the vote of the board, all of those things are still gonna be in place. We're not removing any of that. And, and the reason we're not trying to adjust any of that is because Angie alluded to this earlier in her conversation, that when you do a petition drive, it'll only be a single subject. And so you can't have a petition that says we're going to eliminate income tax and we're going to restrict spending. So it has to be one thing, and so that's what we've done. But, but all of the things that they currently have to adhere to on their budget process will still be in place. Okay. And then um, I guess pretty much my last question is on with the current model that we're working with, the sales tax collected through the county dispersed to the city and through the county itself with the EPIC tax being that consumption tax. Right. I'm assuming it gets filtered through the state and then down from the top down, is that correct? Okay, so let me see if I can clarify what you're asking. Are you asking, can they have a local consumption tax like they do a, a sales tax now, locally? No, I'm, I'm just saying, so like uh, we were talking about with school board and education, all that's collected through the county. Some of the education goes to the state and right. then gets brought back. Yeah, right. But in terms of right. city and, and municipalities, they get that revenue without going to the state and coming back to the right. city. Yeah. That's yeah. the current process. Yeah, the current With process. the EPIC process, is it going, city no longer sees it until they get it handed down from state. The money that will be collected will be collected just like they do sales tax now. The sales tax will go to the state and then they'll send it back. So the treasurer, the county treasurer will still distribute the money like they do now for the budgets, but they'll do it on a monthly basis rather than twice a year. And the advantage will be that that money will be there for to support all of those local units of government. But let me expand a little bit on the question that you didn't ask, and that is, will local units of government be able to have a consumption tax like they have a city? You have a city sales tax, is that correct? You can place that city consumption tax on the ballot for the voters to consider to place a consumption tax at the same rate I think you're allowed to go to 2% or whatever your restriction is, will be the same thing, but you can replace your city sales tax with a consumption tax, and that will be collected locally. So our goal is to try to make sure that all of the money that you currently get from all sources of revenue are still collected. That's the goal. I'd like to make a, 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 an add-on comment to that. Um, Senator Erdman proposed <coughs> replacing your city or county sales tax with an equivalent tax. Because we more than double the base, we more than double the base and add 2% to the state income tax because we're replacing two other major sources of income. When a city or county replaces their sales tax with a consumption tax, they won't need as high a rate in fact, they'll probably need a rate that's half or less than half of what they already have. Why? Because the only revenues they're replacing 
are the revenues generated by that local sales tax, right? So because we more than double the base, you're only going to need half or even less of the rate to collect the same revenue. So you actually can give your, your city or county relief because you only need half the rate that you have now. Have you given it tonight the amount of like um, state employees and county employees that that won't have jobs anymore like the assessor's office where your savings is by doing this have you touched on that I haven't but generally what happens generally what happens is when I say we're going to eliminate the county assessor and the office I usually get applause <laughs> And I'm not being disrespectful to the county assessor, they're doing their job. <clears throat> but that's exactly what will happen. And so we asked the Beacon Hill study this. We asked them, what will the savings be when we eliminate these jobs? Say half of the revenue department's gonna go away because the Department of Revenue that collects its income tax will be eliminated. So the only Department of Revenue we'll need is that department that collects the sales tax. And so that's gonna be a savings as well. All the county assessors will go away. The property assessment division for the state will go away. All of those things will go away. And as you know, this is no secret, we probably have 60, 70,000 jobs in Nebraska that are available to anyone today. So if those people are looking for a job, they can become part of a group of people who make a contribution rather than collect taxes to work at their job. So I'm not worried that they won't be able to find a job. They will be, but I don't know exactly what that number is. But I contend that the savings will be hundreds of millions because we're going to eliminate Department of Revenue. We're going to eliminate all those people who collect taxes. We're going to make it fair and transparent and people will be able to see how much tax you pay. So there's going to be some savings there. But we didn't have the time, nor did we have the money to pay Beacon Hill to dig into our budgets to that degree to answer that question. I just had one more quick, what was the South Dakota exemption that gets to continue? I don't remember what it was. I seen it two years ago, because I wondered how they do that up there. You know, how they have such low property tax and have no income tax. And it's because they don't, I, there was one exemption. I, I don't remember what it was, but there was only one in the whole state. Maybe farming. <laughs> that's all it was. So anyway, but that's, you. but that's, you know, very good question, but there will be savings. <clears throat> So you're talking about eliminating sales tax, income tax, all these taxes, and we're going to have a consumption tax if, if this goes through. So I'm assuming nothing would re restrict a future legislature from adding a sales tax down the road or adding an income tax down the road because they love money. They want to spend yeah. more money. Yep. That's wrong. I'll tell you why it's wrong. This is a constitutional amendment. When you do a constitutional amendment and it says the state can collect no other tax but a consumption tax, that's what it says. The state legislature can't put in place a sales or income tax. Only the people can. So don't be concerned about the legislature. That's why we didn't make this a statute. That's why we didn't make this a law. Because if we made it a law, the next legislature came behind us to change it. It's a constitutional amendment. And the only way to change that, you see, that's the only way we got sales and income tax. You change the constitution. And for a legislative body to change that back would have to do a vote of the people. So that, that's the answer there. All right. Can they raise it? Could they raise the consumption tax? Yeah. You mean, could they raise the rate? Yeah. Yeah, they could, but it's gonna be, we have to make it difficult. We need to make that vote to be like 40, 40 people, 40 senators vote to do that. And and as I said earlier, Laffer said, make sure it is can be adjusted, but it has to be very difficult. Yes, ma'am. Kind of along with the schools, um, my daughter's a teacher, and when I told her I was coming to this, she said, well, if they eliminate the property taxes, then how is our schools gonna get funded? So. Did you, 
Did you already cover that? Like, where does the money come for the school? Or how, is, how are they yeah. funded? Well, we're gonna we're gonna make sure that the schools get their money through the consumption tax proposal, and it's in the distribution model. If you go to epicoption.org, the whole distribution model is there. We're gonna set it up so that the schools get all the money they have. And just let me tell you this: we need to start paying our teachers more. Yeah, I don't know if you know this, but over the last 15 years, administrative costs have gone up 80 percent in our government schools. 80 percent. Teacher salaries, and your daughter will attest to this, have gone up 15%. Who does the work? The teachers do. And we need to make sure that we have the best and brightest, and most of all, those people who like to teach, teaching my grandkids. And so we need to make sure that the funding is there to make sure that they're fully taken care of. And our goal is to make sure they get all the funds that they currently get, and we're gonna add 2% to that to make sure that they get the money. And administrative costs are just out of this world. For example, when I went to high school in Barrett Public Schools, our class was 45 people. Today it's 20. We had one principal in high school and one principal in grade school. Now they got an associate principal. They got a para in every class. We never had paras in any of our classes. So what I'm telling you, education costs way more today than it did when I was there and the people that should be making the extra money are the teachers. So we need to make sure we take care of those and that's our goal. That's why we set our fund up the way we did. It's objective, it's not subjective to some Teosa formula that nobody understands. We need to take care of those people, that's our goal. Okay. I just have a couple other things I wanna say about this, the teachers. One of the things that teachers are not, they're not thinking about necessarily is, because I was a teacher so I know this, uh, if you think about that we would eliminate the income tax, it's like giving the teachers a raise right away because they get to keep their money that they would be paying in the in income tax, so that's more for them. Also, a lot, several of those teachers are also owning their own homes and paying property taxes. And again, that would be like an instant raise by not having to pay property taxes. So those are two really key items that I would encourage anyone to share with teachers if they're on the on the fence about it because <clears throat> by voting in epic they would actually vote themselves a raise mm -hmm. that's just my two points yep. i have another question as kind of a follow-up to scott's question um, regarding nonprofits and specifically like um, schools like concordia wouldn't the I don't know, is when it, I'm looking at my little sheet here, 4D, no taxes on business to business transactions. And that says no, no taxes on businesses, tools, office equipment, shelving. I know that wouldn't really handle buying a new building or something like that, but would that somehow, I mean, could a nonprofit be considered a business? I don't know. My, <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Under, under Nebraska law now, and I believe other states, it is legal for a nonprofit to own a for profit institution. Right? Just think about uh, nonprofits invest in the stock market, right? So clearly that's possible. What would prevent a nonprofit that really provides a service like education from or reorganizing into a profit making school? owned by the nonprofit. The nonprofit can still take donations, tax deductible no donations, and use them for the school. That's, I believe, one solution that they have right now under Nebraska law. May I add, there, there are some complications to that uh, for religious nonprofits because you lose some of the protections that you have as a religious as to what you can teach, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, <clears throat> what, you, what you can teach or not teach and who you can hire and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Diversity and inclusion, right? I get it. Yeah. You know, I, I'll just tell you this. The conversation, the questions you had tonight were well thought out and were thorough. And I've done a lot of presentations and I don't know that I've had this kind of interaction with a group of people that have been a considerate and understanding and as interested as this group has been. And, and
and that's and that is refreshing. And I'm sure glad that Senator Hunter and I came. I'll, I can't speak for him, but I think he probably feels the same way. But it is, and we are concerned. We are concerned about the nonprofits. We're concerned about all the things that we do, how it affects people. But we're also concerned about the current system we have, and if we continue on this, we won't have much left. I'm serious. This. When you wait to see what happens in this legislative body, that, that book right there, that, we're going to add pages to that. We will add pages to that this year because we're going to have other tax codes that we're going to come out with that's going to pick winners and losers, and it'll add to that. We've done it every year. I can guarantee you we'll do it again. But it won't make your life easier. It won't make your tax burden less. And until we revamp our whole tax system, we're going to keep getting what we've been getting. And I don't know about you, but I don't like that. I don't like that. And so my wife and I own four homes, rental properties in Arizona. Those houses are probably worth $250,000 apiece. Our total taxes, you ready for this? Our total taxes is $2,980 on four houses. Our total insurance bill is $2,650 a year. We pay one month, one month's rent on each one of those houses pays our total taxes and insurance for a year. Our homes in Bridgeport, three and a half months rent to pay the taxes and insurance. There is a reason people moved on to Arizona. It's not because they like 115 degrees. And we're gonna have to try to catch up with Wyoming Iowa is going to eliminate their property, their income tax. How do we catch up with those people? We're going to keep losing people, but we got to fix this because I can tell you something. The people in this room are some great people that live in the state of Nebraska, and that's the way the people in Nebraska are. They're great people. It's a great place to live, but we can't keep living under these tax burdens. Because I have a friend who has to go in this next week and try to pay his property tax from last year. He didn't pay him in May and September. He didn't have the money. But he doesn't want his property to be on a tax sale on the first Monday in March because that's what all treasurers do in the state of Nebraska. They sell all of the taxes, all of the taxes that didn't get paid, they sell on March 4th, <clears throat> that first Monday, March 5th, whatever it is. And that's 14% interest. And he's worried. If they pay him this year and he can't pay him next year in three years, he'll be out of his home. That's just one example, and there's many just like that. And I read an article the other day that said, in agriculture in 25, they're predicting agricultural income to be down 40% in 25. Remember, we're an agricultural state. 40% less in 25 than in 24, or 24 and 25, or 23, excuse me. That's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. And so we have to do something. So I don't know how long you want to be here. I'll be here as long as you want to be. But I can tell you this, I do appreciate your questions. I hope we've given you answers that make sense. I hope we've tried to answer those things fairly and honestly as best we could. But I appreciate the fact that you came to listen tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, just a reminder that the petitions are in the back. If you, again, just as a reminder, signing the petition is not a vote. Signing a petition says that you would like to see this get on the ballot. So if you are interested in signing the petition, please do so before you go. And the, like I said, the senator said they'll stick around for a little while, but in the interest of time and people's bedtime and getting to work. Oh, and if you are a registered Republican in the uh, county of Seward and you're interested in coming to our county convention on Sunday, March 3rd at 2 o'clock, I'd love for you to sign up to be a delegate. I will be running again as the to be reelected as the county chair. We'll also be uh, electing our vice chair, secretary, treasurer, and we will be bringing uh, 15 new people onto the county central committee. We're restructuring our representation across Seward County and we are going to elect three county com uh, central committee members from each con uh, commissioner district. So we have five commissioner districts across Seward County. And so we will be electing three people to represent their district. And that'll also, so if you sign up to be a delegate, all you have to do is show up to the convention 
and you'll have a vote. And we've got a notary back here that will take your, you have to be registered by Friday at five o'clock, Friday, March 1st. Um, but she's right here, so you could uh, get your delegate form signed tonight, and then we'll get in touch with you with more details for the Sunday convention. It's gonna be right here in the same location. Yeah, thank you so much for setting this up. I'll leave you with this thought, and some of you may understand what I'm saying. The older you get, the sooner it gets late. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming.